Hello and welcome to this channel. In this video we will talk about uterovaginal tamponade and other measures for managing uterine atony after delivery as well as uterine atony itself. Uterine atony is a term that describes a uterus that doesn't contract appropriately during or after delivery. Uterine contractions are necessary in a vaginal delivery to help the baby to pass through the birth canal. After the delivery, no matter if it was a vaginal delivery or a cesarean section, there is quite an amount of bleeding. In both ways of delivery of a baby, the delivery of the baby is followed by the delivery of the placenta. The placenta is around 20 cm in diameter and after its delivery, the blood vessels that it was connected to are torn and bleed. The body has quite an amazing way of dealing with this huge wound. The placenta was attached to the most superficial layer of the uterus. Under it is the myometrium, a muscular layer. In this muscular layer, the fibers are arranged in a kind of net. The fibers are crossing over each other and the blood vessels lie in between the spaces of that net. When the uterus is now, after the delivery of the placenta, contracting, the muscle fibers become shorter and so the space in between the fibers becomes small and so it presses on the blood vessels. This reduces blood loss. If this process doesn't take place, like in uterine atony, the blood vessels won't be compressed and a huge blood loss occurs, sometimes even so severe that it threatens the mother's life. A uterine atony occurs in around 2-8% of births and is with over 75% the most common cause for postpartum hemorrhage. If you want to know more about postpartum hemorrhage, you can see our video in the gynecology playlist. What can cause uterine atony? Sometimes the uterus can't contract because it is exhausted. This can occur in labor dystopia or prolonged labor where the delivery of the baby took much longer than normal. To deliver the baby, the uterus had to contract forcefully and repeatedly for many hours. This can cause uterine atony. Another cause are uterine myomas. Here there are benign tumors embedded into the wall of the uterus. This can make it difficult for it to contract or the myomas can be in the way of the muscle fibers so that even though the uterus contracts, the blood vessels won't be squeezed on. Also about uterine myomas we have a separate video, so if you're interested in that you can see our video in the gynecology playlist. Another cause is polyhydramnios. This refers to a larger amount of amniotic fluid than normal. In this case, the uterus was really heavily distended and it can be difficult for it to contract. A similar scenario occurs in macrosomia. Here the baby weighs over 4 kg at the time of delivery at term, which also puts an extra burden on the uterus. Other risk factors for uterine atony are infections as chorioamnionitis, a maternal BMI of over 40, or that the mother received medications that reduced the uterine contraction, such as magnesium sulfate or anesthetics. How does uterine atony present after delivery? As we said, it usually goes hand in hand with a large amount of blood being lost after the delivery of the placenta. This blood loss can also lead to hypotension and shock. We can also feel the uterus. After the delivery, the uterus goes approximately up to the umbilicus of the mother. Usually the uterus should contract and this can be felt on the abdomen of the mother. In case of uterine atony, the uterus is soft and larger than we would expect it to be. We can also do a speculum examination to identify the source of the bleeding. It is also possible that there was for example a vaginal injury during the delivery, 
which might be the cause for the blood loss. When we suspect uterine atony, we should also test the coagulation status of the patient. Coagulation disorders are rather rare, but it is possible that the patient has an underlying coagulopathy that causes a postpartum hemorrhage. In that case, we can substitute the deficient coagulation factors. How can we treat uterine atony? There are generally four different treatment approaches. The first one is the manual treatment. Here the doctor places one hand on the abdomen of the patient, just above the pubic bone, and firmly massages the fundus of the uterus. It is also possible to insert one hand into the birth canal, where the uterine artery can be compressed, which reduces the overall blood flow to the uterus. This treatment approach is usually an emergency measure and is done before the next treatment steps can be initiated. This procedure is called uterine massage or fundal massage. The next treatment approach is pharmacological treatment. This is usually done by medications that encourage the uterus to contract. Examples are oxytocin, which can be given either by venous infusion or intramuscularly, or we can also use prostaglandins. Oxytocin is usually the preferred medication as it has a very rapid onset of action. The third treatment approach is called uterine tamponade. Here we try to stop the blood loss from inside the uterus. The most commonly used device is called Bakri balloon. The Bakri balloon consists of the balloon itself and another smaller balloon, which are both on a catheter and can be filled with saline by the help of a syringe. The bigger one of the balloons is inserted into the uterus and filled with saline solution to compress the blood vessels. The second smaller balloon is placed directly under the cervix and is also filled with saline solution. The second balloon helps to keep the bigger one in place. The Bakri balloon usually has the ability to hold around half a liter of saline solution. The last treatment approach is the surgical treatment. This is usually the last resort option. The first step within the surgical treatment is to perform a uterine curettage. A curettage is performed with an instrument called curette. It kind of is like a long spoon with either a solid or fenestrated end part. With this the uterine cavity can be examined and any removing parts of placental tissue or blood clots that have been formed can be removed. The next step is to ligate the uterine artery. The uterine artery is responsible for the blood supply of the uterus and to clip off the uterine artery will control the bleeding at its source. Another option are compression sutures, also called b lunch suture. Here we make two parallel suture lines over the surface of the uterus. The suture is made in a way that we can pull on the threads for them to mechanically decrease the size of the uterus. This can be done in case of uterine atony after a cesarean section. As a last step, if everything else failed, a hysterectomy can be considered. What are complications of uterine atony? In case of delayed or ineffective treatment, the patient might develop a hypovolemic shock. Also, the Sheehan syndrome can occur. This is a necrosis of the pituitary gland. During pregnancy, the pituitary gland undergoes a physiological hyperplasia. Due to this hyperplasia, the pituitary gland needs an increased amount of blood supply. In the case of postpartum hemorrhage, the pituitary gland is not receiving enough blood and ischemia and necrosis occur. This can lead to hypopituitarism. Also, anemia can develop after severe blood loss. It is usually treated with iron supplements until the lost blood volume is restored. That's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. And if you like our channel, please subscribe. 
Thank you for watching and hopefully see you again in the next video.